Well, uh, Martina, we plan to hold the Harassis Global Meeting already in March, and then uh, COVID caught us, so no chance to hold a meeting in person. So we decided to go digital, and we did a lot of research and say, you know, how could it be done? Uh, especially against the backdrop that we have usually close to 900, 1,000 speakers. Can't do it on a you know Zoom call. We found online platform um, based in the Silicon Valley, a, a young startup company, and we started with this adventure. So yeah, finally we got uh, 900 speakers uh, during one long day, including the UN Secretary General, maybe the largest um, online meeting held by any organization so far globally. We got also four head of states and around um, 15 ministers. One of the highlights, uh, I would say, was uh, Richard Branson's panel. Richard Branson joined us from his um, private island in the Caribbean, sitting on his veranda, and uh, talked to us. So this was, uh, you know, fantastic, uh, getting people from all around the world. We finally got around um, 85 nations participating. And uh, yeah, of course, the other highlight, uh, the UN Secretary General who opened the meeting, he was calling for more togetherness, for more dialogue, because the world is kind of falling apart and we need to join hands to make this world a better place to live on. Frank, I'm very curious. So what was Richard Branson's message? Richard Branson talked about climate change and oceans. Uh, he's very much engaged in philanthropy. So he's not only running his airline and uh, his various other uh, activities, but uh, he basically said, we can't wait. And uh, business has to make a contribution. It's not enough just to protest and go to the streets, but we need real action. And um, I think Richard Branson was really echoing the whole message of the whole summit saying that it's time to act, we can't wait anymore, and we have to put um, all our power, our forces uh, together, you know, to, to make this change happen. For us, the word uh, comes from Greek, right? It means the act of seeing, basically a vision. So when you set it up, what was your vision? And if we talk about real action, what kind of action do you want to see and what do you want to create as an impact with Horasis? Well, you know, I was always um, inspired by Greek uh, mythology, so I've chosen a Greek word. <laughs> Horasis in that in, indeed means, um, you know, gazing, envisioning, seeing what's happening in the future. And it's all about uh, what's happening at Horasis. We would like to inspire the future. We are very much looking into the future and trying to shape the future. So we are on the one hand uh, a think tank, but also a do tank, because we would like to see things um, happening and change happening. So give you an example, um, at the last meeting earlier uh, this month, we got a panel with six African former head of states working on a peace initiative in Western Africa. So we started this initiative and now we are um, bringing in more resources and, and try to uh, monitor uh, this project. So that's basically what we want to do. Uh, we want to move the talk to action, uh, the dialogue um, to real impact. A lot of people compare Horatius to another Davos, a mini Davos. Why does the world need a second Davos? Well, um, surely we don't really uh, compare us with Davos. You know, we are a different type of organization and we do our own benchmarking. You know, our Davos, if you wish, is uh, Kashkais. It's a small location close to Lisbon, where our global meeting is held every year. And we would like to be more um, inclusive. So we invite CEOs and head of states, mostly from emerging countries. At the last meeting, for example, we got uh, the prime minister of a very small island nation, Cape Verde, who spoke to us. We got also the president of Namibia. So not only you know the G20 countries, uh, the club of um, the rich and wealthy and powerful uh, are joining us, but the emerging leaders. Um, also, we are inviting not only the CEOs of large companies, Fortune 500 companies, we got a few at uh, the last meeting, but we also invite the next generation. We invite startups and uh, promising entrepreneurs. So I think that's uh, what is really setting us apart. Uh, we have a very um, good representation um, globally in various continents, uh, even Latin America. We got a couple of Latin American ministers joining and also the um, um, uh, president of Venezuela, uh, Juan Guaido, who joined us. So that's uh, what Horasis is all about. And uh, yes, we are growing and we would like to, to join hands with like-minded organizations. 
When I met you the first time about a year ago, I was really impressed by two things. One is that you invite a lot of emerging markets and developing markets, uh, economies and representatives and guests to Horaces. And the second is that you are a single man band. Basically, I was thinking that you had a lot of people, a big team in the background, but you are actually managing everything by yourself. And then you visit also these countries. Uh, you've been to Mali and Laos and um, the Philippines and Mexico, and you actually go meet these people first and then you invite them. So it's a huge travel organization, of course, as well, now a bit more difficult. Uh, what drives you and what kind of um, impact would you like to make in these uh, developing markets? You know, the, the fun part really is uh, to travel and to meet these people. That's, um, you know, the rationale behind all the trips around the world, even to places like Mali and uh, other small countries. And, you know, those countries which are not really represented on the global scene. Um, as we said, you know, Horace is very small, um, but, you know, we work with many partners globally, you know, friends, supporters, uh, people who like what we do and help us, um, you know, reach out to governments, reach out to CEOs and invite them uh, on behalf of us. And, and that's a bit the secret that, you know, Horace is even so very small, it's actually a partnership uh, of like-minded people. Uh, what drives me, you know, I get up early in the morning and um, uh, I start to work on Horasis and, uh, you know, it's never boring. I think there are so many interesting things coming up, interesting personalities. And, you know, when you look into the profile of people joining um, our meeting, uh, they look very uh, heterogeneous. But, you know, there's one maybe joining or kind of common element. They're all very interesting people. They did something interesting in their life. And that's a reason we invite them. Frank, I've never met a person with a more organized mind than you. Super impressive. Going back to the Horatius uh, Extraordinary Meeting for this year, the theme is uh, Unite, Inspire and Create. If there are three things on the agenda for 2020, what are the things you are inspiring and what are the things you are creating? Well, um, surely we feel that the world is um, falling uh, apart. There's so much of uh, protectionism in the world, so much of nationalism and uh, egocentric uh, behavior. I would say, you know, the Machiavellian mindset is back, um, especially now with COVID. It's a, a bit of, a, you know, doc e doc mentality and a lot of finger pointing. We at Horasis want to achieve just uh, the country. We want to unite. We want to inspire. We want to create. We want to pre really bring people together um, to join hands. And, um, you know, um, I think there's a big chance for that. Um, at the meeting, we discussed, uh, for example, the future of capitalism and saying that we need a more inclusive capitalism. Many companies are just short-term oriented and they need more long-term orientation, not just um, trying to boost up the share price, but to care for um, their employees and for all their stakeholders. And uh, with Horasis, with the Horasis process, we would like to support it. And I think there's a big chance uh, it's happening now. Uh, you know, if you look into, you know, the big thing in uh, three weeks time, the US elections, uh, you have really the choice, Americans have the choice between, you know, a more um, closed uh, shop, a more closed world, a more closed America or an open America. And we see tendencies uh, in most countries in the world, also in Europe. And we uh, would like to encourage citizens, um, companies, um, and uh, international organizations to go for the multilateral approach. Given that your business model, Frank, is based on partnerships, it must be really difficult to make money out of a virtual events platform right now. Tell us a little bit about your funding pipeline or how you work with business to also generate a little bit of revenue, despite you know the vision. And I guess you put that above the uh, money-making machine. Uh, it's a very uh, tricky question, and I think you put it right, Martina. The vision comes first, um, the goal comes first, and, and money comes second. This was always the principle um, in my life. And I think if you do good things, uh, the money will follow, and it shouldn't be you know, the, the most important purpose of uh, a company. Um, you know, concretely, um, at this meeting, we are short of sponsorships, obviously. Usually, you know, a country is inviting us and covering the cost and um, 
providing us funding. Uh, in a digital sphere, of course, uh, that's not possible. What we did um, this time, we asked all participants from business to contribute a small fee. And, um, you know, just a small fee, a nominal fee, and it worked quite well. Actually, most people contributed. Uh, so, yeah, um, financially, it's, it's not ideal, but I think we are very happy, you know, that we got so much of support. And so many people said, you know, let's support Horasis in a critical time, in a difficult time. Uh, going forward, we would like to introduce a membership uh, after uh, COVID uh, is settled. And, uh, you know, when um, our participants, the regular participants, join us on a membership basis. I think uh, community building is really the cradle. You know, we want to create um, a community of like-minded business leaders. And I think the best form for that uh, is, is a membership-based model. I think in Chinese, there is a saying, actually in Daoism, it says when a person is on the path, there are many who come to aid. Going back to the theme of 2020, you just mentioned about inclusive capitalism. You talked about multilateralism. What should the next uh, multilateralism look like in your mind? I think we have to um, uh, work with the United Nations. The United Nations is really the, the centerpiece um, of multilateralism, and we should give more power to the United Nations. Um, sometimes I feel the UN is a bit of a lame duck because you know there's not enough funding. Um, the American president, for example, announced to cut uh, the funding uh, to United Nations uh, that cut also the funding to some um, agencies like the WHO. And it's a wrong way. I think we should give more power and more money uh, to those institutions. We should also look into um, new upcoming organizations. Um, so we got, for example, in China, the new Silk Road. Um, and uh, it's a Chinese initiative, uh, which is not so much uh, accepted by the Western world. But I think, you know, the, the Silk Road is not something um, in competition to the existing organizations. It's more complementary. And I think the more um, regional organizations, global organizations we have, uh, the better. I also strongly believe in the G20. The G20 is the right formula to also include emerging countries into the club of the G7 and G8. And um, I think, you know, um, on the long term, the G20 will be the most important organization and uh, the G7, G8 might disappear. Uh, so yes, in, in short, uh, multilateralism needs more um, international commitment, uh, better coordination between nation states and international organizations, and more power to the United Nations. Some argue that uh, the United Nations obviously you know, face a lot of reforms and have lost so much power, but uh, that private business um, and responsible businesses, those who really put efforts uh, in for sustainability and CSR like you know, Salesforce or, or Google with new initiatives and so on, Alibaba, that they could actually match the United Nations and replace the United Nations in certain regards when it comes to helping, for example, with, um, you know, COVID-19 efforts or climate change and so on. Uh, do you agree with that? Do you think that maybe private sector businesses could actually level the United Nations? I think they would never be able to level the United Nations, but they can support the, the UN. Um, I believe in a, a real stakeholder approach or multi-stakeholder approach. We need business, government, and international organizations. So if Google and Alibaba uh, can join the United Nations, uh, I think it's a perfect match. And uh, there are already many projects um, going on, especially Alibaba, you know, is doing a lot with UN. They're involved in the... Um, bridging the digital divide uh, initiative. And it's um, Jack Ma himself, Ma Yun himself, who is doing that. Uh, so that's uh, the way to go. And um, yes, you know, um, sometimes I feel there's a huge divide between the private sector and uh, the public sector. And, uh, you know, each um, sector is not really, you know, um, um, tuned and accustomed to deal with the other sector. And maybe here a platform like uh, Horasis comes in and uh, can, can bridge this uh, divide. We got a session at the extraordinary meeting with the UN Undersecretary Fabrizio Hochschild, who is in charge of UN 75, the anniversary, the 75th anniversary of the UN. And, uh, you know, we um, introduced uh, business leaders um, wanting to support the UN. And uh, yeah, I think um, uh, in an ideal world, uh, more and more companies subscribe also to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, to the UN Global Compact. 
and work hand in hand with the UN. Frank, you just talked about this divide and trying to bridge the gap between different geographical regions and different market sectors between the public and the private. But I would say, though, there is a huge divide between the developed and the emerging world as well. Sometimes uh, with uh, China being a, a prominent player in the emerging world, I feel a lot of the conversations going in parallel universes. What are the most difficult things you think that are breaking this connection, this convergence between the emerging world and the developed world today? Let's maybe talk about China for a second. And um, China is an emerging country and has, of course, um, a very special task. On the one hand, it's developing. It's very powerful. It's the second largest trading nation in the world after the U.S. Still, it's emerging. You know, it um, uh, has uneven development itself between the western and the eastern part of the country. Uh, but when China goes to um, the world stage, there's always criticism coming up, you know, um, uh, in the US, but also in Europe, uh, talking about um, uneven trade, where, you know, Chinese exports are being, um, uh, you know, um, subsidized by the Chinese government. It's a usual argument by the West, which I believe it's not true. I think we should uh, take China as it is, and we should uh, have, uh, see China on the same level playing field um, and try to build partnerships with China. Um, I think that's, that's important. And, um, you know, the rise of China uh, reminds me with uh, the rise um, of um, other countries in the past. Think about, you know, the rise of um, the United States. You know, the UK was the most powerful country at the time. And then the United States became the most powerful country. And, you know, we see always uh, frictions, you know, when one country is moving up and challenging uh, the um, uh, uh, the power, um, uh, the, the superpower at this time. Right, but if I may interrupt your friend there, but uh, by comparing China to the United States and the United Kingdom, the underlying notion, the assumption is that China is going to become the greatest power in the world. Is that the case? You know, China, um, the Chinese government um, is not telling us that. Still, I think uh, from an economic point of view, it's happened. And if you think about, you know, all this mighty Chinese companies rising, you know, think about Tencent, Alibaba, Huawei, and many others. They're not just, you know, cheap manufacturers anymore, but they're leading in terms of technology and innovation. So it's happening. China is becoming uh, the number one. Uh, maybe not um, in two, three, five years time, but maybe in 10, 15 years time. It's difficult um, to make a prediction, but uh, I think we shouldn't be warned. We shouldn't be afraid. Uh, we should just accept the fact that uh, China is becoming economic leader. Of course, that will also be a topic uh, of the upcoming Asia Horasis meeting, which will take place on the 30th of November. So you're fully busy preparing for that one already. Frank, give us a little bit of an appetizer. What can we expect from that one? Well, um, at this summit, uh, Martina, we have around uh, 400 speakers from all over Asia, plus um, America and, and Europe, and uh, even a few African and Latin American leaders investing in Asia. But, uh, you know, primarily um, focusing on the Asian region, Southeast Asia, plus China, Korea, Japan, India. And, uh, you know, what we would like to see is that Asian nations also um, get closer together. There are several um, um, linkages already. Think about ASEAN in Southeast Asia or the SARC region, India, um, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh and the Maldives uh, and Nepal. But, um, you know, those different um, alliances are not really um, working uh, as, for example, the European Union is working. It's mostly actually a, a trade alliance. There's uh, not much uh, beyond, you know, trade uh, and commerce. That's not much about uh, an Asian identity. I think there are so many different Asian identities. And we see a lot of rich countries in Asia, think about Singapore or Hong Kong, but then a lot of poor countries, think about Myanmar or Laos and, and others. So I think Asia uh, needs to you know, put its act together and um, uh, think about this Asian unity. Um, and that's the major theme of the summit, especially in post-COVID times. On a positive note, Martina, I believe that um, COVID is kind of accelerating um, Asian unity and Asian integration. There have been a lot of um, visits in the last few, uh, few weeks. Um, for example, uh, the Singaporean uh, Prime Minister, he um, said, you know, especially when it comes to health, Asia has to work together and uh, should be much more than just uh, a, trade, uh, a trade alliance. We will also talk about um, Asia's relationships with the outside world, Asia and Europe, Asia 
um, and the United States, there will be a special plenary on the results of the US election and the impact uh, on Asia. So yeah, please expect uh, a very uh, interesting and lively discussion and uh, hopefully an interesting outcome as well. You talked about the Asian diversity. It is indeed the most uh, diverse and the pluralistic region in the world. It has every religion present. It has the world's uh, largest population, no doubt. How would this uh, Asian integration project even be possible? How would you even take it on the, the official agenda of these Asian leaders? I think we have to go in small steps, maybe starting with ASEAN, ASEAN plus three, and then, you know, growing the whole alliance, you know, step by step. Um, ASEAN plus three and the Asian, uh, ASEAN economic community is already uh, existing. Uh, we mentioned before the role of the private sector, and I think the private sector um, is leading this change. You know, many um, companies are investing in each other's countries. Think about China and Japan. The two countries um, are sometimes not at the best um, terms. Uh, you know, there have been, you know, uh, back to history issues between both countries. But, uh, you know, China and Japan um, are very strong trading partners. And uh, I think, you know, China is very much depending um, on Japanese technology and um, Japan is very much depending on, on Chinese uh, investment. So it's a win-win situation on, uh, for companies and I think governments um, have to follow suit and uh, make this um, integration happen. I think we have to overcome history and um, look into the future when we shape uh, this new Asian century. If you want to invite uh, five Chinese companies, uh, which five would you like to invite? <laughs> Good question. I think I would go maybe for um, some private sector leaders and uh, maybe Huawei, especially because Huawei is so uh, kind of, uh, you know, discussed, especially in the Western world, uh, in the US and Europe. But I think we should give Huawei a chance and, uh, and to speak out. Um, likewise, um, Maybe, you know, um, uh, you know the, the owner of uh, TikTok, ByteDance, could be of interest, especially to the young people. Uh, and a few other, you know, tech companies, of course, Alibaba, you know, um, Jack Ma is always very good to have. Um, and maybe looking also in some of the um, startups, especially in, in Shenzhen and other regions, um, you know, Western commentators usually forget that um, China is um, not just a, a state-owned company, it's driven country, of course, are very large state on companies, think about Bao Steel or Bank of China and others, but the real development is happening in, in the private sector. So in the long term, I see that, you know, the private sector in China is playing a much, much uh, greater role. And already now, you know, uh, state-owned companies are being listed in Hong Kong, in New York. So in a way, you know, the state-owned companies of the past are no longer existent. You know, they're also partly private right now.